Welcome everyone to today's Florida Food Forum. I am Erica Hall, the incoming chair of the Florida Food Policy Council. With me today is the council administrator, Kendra Love. Today we are focusing on a very important topic within the food system, which is Black Farmers Matter. We are grateful to have our panelists with us today to discuss this topic. We will be giving each presenter 10 minutes to discuss a little bit about their background, their work, policy that affects their work, and recommendations going forward into the future. From there, we will ask our panelists to answer some prepared questions we received from you, our attendees, previously, and then we will open up for more questions. Before we begin, we would like to thank our sponsors. This month's Florida Food Forum is sponsored by FEED and J. Haskins Law. FEED stands for Food for Health, the Environment, Economy, and Democracy. It is a consultancy based in Fort Lauderdale, dedicated to the ideals of its name. It specializes in food systems planning, GIS analysis, advocacy, and education about food systems and healthy communities. The contact for FEED is Anthony Oliveri. J. Haskins Law, located in Tampa, empowers communities with the legal and risk management tools they need to exercise food sovereignty. The contact for J. Haskins Law is Jesse Haskins. We are most appreciative of both Feed and J. Haskins Law's sponsorship of this month's forum. For information on sponsoring a future forum, see our website or, contract or contact Kendra Love. Thank you all again for joining us today. We are very excited and we have a great discussion planned for you all today. We will begin with Tanika Watford Williams, the executive director of the Moore Wright Group located in Washington State. Following Tanika will be Angelique Taylor and David Kip Ritchie, regenerative farmers and owners of Smarter by Nature LLC, located in Tallahassee, Florida. And finally, we have Carla Bristol. She will talk about her efforts in St. Petersburg, Florida, as collaboration manager of the St. Petersburg Youth Farm. We will now turn it over to Tanika. Tanika, would you be Begin by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, your work, policy that affects your work, and recommendations for the future. So thank you for having me. I'm Tanika Watford Williams. I am currently the executive director of the More Right Group. Um, and you have some slides. Yes. So about me. So we'll go to the next slide. So the More Right Group is a nonprofit. Our mission is to break the cycle of poverty, abuse, and abandonment by providing hope. But these two lovely people here are my parents. So I am the daughter of Hattie Moore and Jesse Moore, um, both who, one, are Black farmers, but two, also instilled in me growing up um, the importance of our community, the importance of our food system, the importance of us, right? So. The More Right Group was founded to the principles of helping people thrive, but I am also the granddaughter of a sharecropper, a sharecropper from North Carolina who my grandmother also had a small, what she called garden that was 20 acres, right, that helped instill in me the importance of growing your food, helping your community with that food, and how education and everything around us can help us grow. So my background is um, from the education that my parents taught me, I then went on and started a produce distribution company, kind of fell into that, that system, right? And then once I was, I owned a produce distribution company, I learned of a lot of holes and issues that existed because I recognized that a lot of food that was coming to our facility wasn't coming from Black farmers, right? We learned that a lot of things around us um, didn't allow for our farmers to be able to thrive. So then from there, we, I personally, um, 
worked within a, another organization to help bridge those gaps. So my point today is to hopefully come before you and give you a little bit of history, if you will, to set up for some of the people who are doing a lot more things now, and also tell you a little bit about policies that are coming forth as well. So the next slide. So a little background. So according to our last census, Black farmers make up 1.2% of all farmers, 1% of all ag sales, and our average age of Black farmers is 61 years old. Um, I will stop on that because our average age of farmers used to be 68. The reason for that number change is actually a little bit of adjustment from a lot younger farmers coming in who have a, a average age of about 29 and some of our older farmers being about 74 to 75, right? So that brought that number down a little bit to 61, but the average age of all other farmers is 54 to 57, right? So the difference in those years creates a lot of different issues for our producers and our processors, um, which also adds into our ag sales. And 1.2% of all of our farmers are black farmers, but also within that number are a lot of older farmers with smaller farms versus other farmers of other colors. And only 62% of our farmers have access to internet, which then limits access to our farmers for information and resources, especially times of now, like we're all virtual. I'm coming to you from Washington State, right? So the numbers of our farmers not having access to internet and basic resources to connect and, ex and extend the services they offer and information out about them and the resources leaves our farmers to a very, dis a very much so disadvantaged. It also doesn't help our farmers to be able to increase sales and access the avenues to increase those sales. Next slide. So I'm one about history, right? Because I believe that history leads us up to a point of understanding. Um, so a little bit of history that I, I love to tell a story about is the George Washington Carver Movable School, right? I'm a Tuskegee girl. And a lot of people don't know the story behind how some of our, our extension services within the USDA were formed. So George Washington Carver came to Tuskegee and had the idea of beyond educating there, how do we get our farmers the information they need to be able to produce more, have crops on consistent rotation, how to rotate crops, and how to actually help our farmers, not just to be consumers, but to be producers and to supply to consumers, right? So the idea of a movable school came about but Tuskegee needed funding. So they went to an investor, last name Jessup in New York, and got funding. So the picture on the left being from the Jessup Agricultural Wagon. Um, and the wagon went around Sundays, usually weekends, lended equipment and helped farmers to be able to farm. It also taught farmers' wives often how to produce other items. So we were all call those value-added products now, right? How do we how do we pickle things? How do we how do we cut and process things to make them quicker? Um, and the man in the middle of this picture is Thomas Campbell, who would later become one of the first extension workers um, because he was associated and working with the Jessup wagon and the George Washington Carver Removal School. And everyone always asks, why do I start with this story? I have this conversation about the history because. This right here helps set a framework of all the mechanisms, all, but a lot of the mechanisms to help farmers be better producers through the USDA and their farm program. But we come to a time of now where a lot of those services still do not touch and help the people they were set up to be able to help. Right. So the next slide for me. So that brings us to Pickford. Right, it's not a big jump. I just did. I understand that, but a lot of people have a conversation about Pickford, and they want to say that Pickford was existence to be able to help 
farmers now. And that information is incorrect. Pickford was set up to right the wrongs of the past. And a lot of people want to have a conversation that Pickford should have the ability to help farmers right now to be able to thrive. Um, but when you look at the numbers, so the background of Pickford is that farmers were being discriminated against in the USDA, right? The same mechanism that was supposed to come in to help them be educated, um, to be able to expand their farms and all the same principles of the movable school, the movable school bus, to be able to take your goods and your wares into your community and help everyone to be able to thrive and to help your farm be sustainable. Um, but oftentimes black farmers were one, not given loans. According to the actual lawsuit, it said that farmers were actually black farmers, loans were processed three times slower than any other racial makeup of farmers. Um, and then also a lot of the loans that were given, farmers didn't know that they were actually had those loans, right? So then the USDA would come back and say, you defaulted on your loan and then take your land. So then, so we're not moving forward. This money was to right the wrongs. But when you look at a billion dollars paying out 13,000 farmers the first time, that's 75 to to $100,000 to help make the wrongs wrong of something that happened 30 years prior. So that doesn't build our foundation for now and then. It actually makes it so that the wrongs in the past were taken care of and it's not something current. So I have to share that information because sometimes the conversation is, why doesn't that create change now? Um, and how does that not set people up on the Black farmers for a positive platform right now? We have a generation of people whose families were, were decimated, right? We have a generation of people whose fathers and mothers died waiting for funding to happen and died in the process and lost everything that their family had. So next slide, and I'll speed up here. <laughs> so a little information about right now and um, uh, one piece of legislation that is going through right now is the Justice for Black Farmers Act um, that should be released fully, but the information is also out um, for you to read and do some research. A lot of components of this act also help with some of the gaps that have happened with the land being stolen and access to education and a lot of different components. Will this fix everything? No, but the point of it is to be able to help so that people, so we have access to land and to be able to grow and to be able to um, help our farmers to succeed, right? There are different components of agriculture and agriculture take, touches everything. But if our farmers are only taught about farmers markets and CSAs and not full production and a whole bunch of other things, then we want, then how can our farmers also be able to be more than 1% of all ag sales? So that is that part and a little bit of information um, about what's going on, where we've been, and hopefully what's to come so that we can help Black farmers to be able to thrive. Um, and to be able to succeed and to keep moving forward. So the next slide, if you have questions, of course, we're here at the end. And again, I want to thank you um, just for having me come on. It's not something that the More Right Group does steadily now with agriculture, um, but my history and my heart is always in it. And it's amazing how I've had these conversations 10 years ago about the importance of Pickford, right? And the importance of our farmers and the importance of bringing in, being able to be to the forefront right now. Um, and we're still having these conversations 10 years later, right? So that is why farmers matter because we should have the same access to be able to grow and produce and to help our families in the same way as well. So I wanna thank you for your time and I'll be here for questions. Thank you so much, Tanika. And um, I just want to say uh, to everyone on the call, uh, Tanika is my mentor. I'd be remiss if I didn't 
give her that that those props in that respect. If it wasn't for her and me meeting her in DC and working with her, she taught me about the subculture of black farmers and the plight that faced uh, generations of black farmers and, and land loss and the law and how uh, we lost so much land from slavery up until this Pickford um, uh, landmark legislation. So I want to thank her for kind of being the one that kind of brought me to this work. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Angelique and Kip. They are from, they're regenerative farmers and owners of Smarter by Nature, located in Tallahassee, Florida. Will you two start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, your work, policy that affects your work and recommendations for the future. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. My name is Angelique Taylor. And I'm Kit. And we are regenerative farmers representing our business, Smarter by Nature. We are a small scale regenerative farm located in Quincy, Florida. And our mission is to facilitate sustainable relationships between people and the natural environment by providing fresh food and education to the local community. We started our business in 2017 to address the lack of fresh food in our community. We are in a food desert and surrounded by a lot of fast food places and we decided we wanted to be an asset to our community by learning different growing methods that would not only feed people but also restore the natural environment. We grow um, for our farmers market and we are also certified permaculture designers. So we use different growing methods that would help feed the soil as well as grow healthy plants. Part of, um, in, in today's world with agriculture, agriculture as a whole is changing. Um, one of the main things about agriculture is the excessive use of chem chemical fertilizers and the continuous tilling, which um, is a practice that's been going on uh, since the industrial era of agriculture. What happens is with continuous tilling of the land, you create hard pan in the soil and that helps that uh, prevents roots, health healthy roots from establishing with our crops. So farmers worldwide um, by with this continuous excessive tilling are seeing lower crop yields and they're having to add more minerals into their soil through the use of chemical fertilizers. So it's two practices that are going hand in hand that the USDA is deciding that it's, it's time for a change. So as regenerative farmers, we look at these current issues and we face them head on with our own practices of no-tilling and the use of natural and organic fertilizers and pesticides. Um, when it comes to the use of chemical fertilizers, one of the main issues today is water runoff. And um, when we have with climate change or with whatever you call it, but with climate change and with the way that the road is going today, we're seeing uh, longer drought seasons and we're seeing excessive water uh, in our space. Uh, Guatemala just had a hurricane that devastated and all throughout uh, Central America, but uh, one of the main factors was mudslides and uh, water. But what happens with that water is that all of those chemicals that are used from large-scale agriculture, they go into our water streams and they pollute our waterways. So it's a systematic change that's occurring today that's um, happening, and young farmers including ourselves at the forefront of addressing those issues. Um, these, this is why permaculture, regenerative farming and sustainability, these are words that are becoming new trends, uh, but there's something that's, it's, it's 
uh, it's a huge necessity for our space, not only to think about food for your community, but to think about healing the earth in the process. Um, we use cover crops a lot, which are uh, crops that, I mean, people talk about this, like you said, George Washington Carver uh, helped establish the use of cover crops in the large scale agriculture, but it's something that's been veered away from that we're just getting back to. Uh, we started our business in 2017, and we actually served the Tallahassee community, um, but we grow food 30 minutes away out of Quincy, Florida. We have volunteers come out every Friday and Sunday from 9 to 11, and they get hands-on experience in terms of what we do. A large part of what we do has to do with hand tools. We're considered small-scale farmers. Our farm is a total of five acres but we're actually cultivating one acre of space. And it was done with the sweat on our backs um, with hand tools, Angelique and myself, it mainly us that uh, cultivate this space. Uh, Y'all can check that. Y'all can check out our videos and everything that we do, our journey on our social media platforms. But it's something that we're proud of. Um, and we're learning every day. One of the values that we bring to our, our online audience is that we share our mistakes um, that we make along the way and we share the lessons that we learn, not just the good and the food that we grow, but we share our challenges. And it's something that uh, we think is highly important today is to demystify the agriculture sector and to make it something that's accessible for people. I think that one of the main issues is that a lot of people don't know where their food is grown. They don't know where it's come from. If you ask a kid today, where does their food come from? That I tell you the grocery store. So there's a huge disconnect between consumers and producers. And that's something that uh, we're looking to bridge. And we also look to inspire others to start growing where they are because you, you can be regenerative gardeners on a small scale and up to a large scale. So there's different practices that can be adopted by anyone and really everyone across the world. So what we do is share our experience and just share our journey because this is only the beginning. We're so glad that there's so many people that, that are interested in the food system and trying to make it better. I have um, a background in environmental science. That's what I study. And really my passion for growing came from a just a love for the environment. And I wanted to help restore and to have sustainable systems throughout the world for the future generations to enjoy. Um, Kip has a background in sociology and he, we together um, thinking about the earth and thinking about the people and society, it goes hand in hand and that's why we created Smarter by Nature. I, I would say that one of our biggest challenges that we face uh, is uh, access to equipment and infrastructure. So when we started our business, we started it uh, urban gardening in small in smaller spaces, and but we decided that we wanted to grow more food to help feed our food desert here in Tallahassee. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, a food desert considered by the USDA is any space, any community that doesn't have access to fresh local food within a mile and a half radius of that given space. So we live on the south side of Tallahassee and that includes our space. Um, for us, we have two uh, forms of policy that we would recommend. Uh, is that okay for me to say right now? Please, cool. go ahead. So one of them is we believe that there should be a mandatory class on food education from elementary to high school. Uh, food is, a, is such an underrated core aspect of culture. Uh, it's something that everybody has to engage in all the time. And we need new entrepreneurs. We, we need younger people to be, uh, food is so vast and it's not only just farming. Uh, like Tanika mentioned, it's also processing goods as well. It can happen on a small scale and on a large scale. And I think that just how we study math, science, reading and writing, agriculture should be a core part 
taught in uh, institutions, which brings to the next uh, policy recommendation. And that would be that at least 20% of food used in institutions be purchased from local farmers within a 200 mile radius of the given institution. Um, and pretty much there's a huge disconnect between institutions and communities. We live in Tallahassee, Florida. We have Florida State and F I mean, Florida State, FSU, and FAMU, two huge institutions with over 20,000 students, but um, they have no idea about what's going on in the community around them. So to be able to say that the food served at that institution comes from farmers in that area and for any given city, we think that'd be a huge step towards progressing in the food system. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Angelique and Kip. That was a great presentation. And again, I'm so inspired by the work that you do and we'll hold questions until later. I see on the chat, there are a lot of questions for you too. Again, thank you for the work that you're doing. Finally, uh, we want to leave room for questions. So I want to move right into our next presentation. Finally, we have Carla Bristol. She's the collaboration manager of the St. Petersburg Youth Farm. And uh, she'll present about her work. And she'll tell us a bit about herself, her background, her pol policy that affects her work and recommendations for the future. Again, I live in St. Petersburg and I met Carla um, work becoming a part of the youth farm. Again, I believe the youth is our future, the generation, and we have to develop a leadership, a future pipeline of leadership and develop our youth to be ready to step up and take the reins of leadership in this food systems. And Carl is one of those people that are helping to develop that future pipeline of leadership. So Carl, please go ahead. Thank you so much. So unlike uh, the previous panelists, I um, I was born in South America, so born in Guyana, uh, grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and then moved to St. Petersburg, Florida in 1996. Zero background. As a matter of fact, um, when I decided to get into this work, one of the things that I said was that um, at, at best, um, I am not I'm not a gardener. That's just not what I do. But I know that I could lift and provide visibility to this space and to this conversation. I'm an entrepreneur. I come from a global sales uh, background. And the program that was established in uh, 2019, the goal and the aims of the program was first and foremost to address an issue with food scarcity in um, our South St. Petersburg area, known as the South St. Petersburg CRA. Uh, the goal of the program was also to create uh, what we call economic workforce development for youth. So our young people, the, the young, um, the youth that you see here, they're all paid uh, 10 to $12 an hour. Right now they're being paid uh, 12 50 an hour for youth development, which includes everything from character building. Uh, we teach black history. We teach entrepreneurship, uh, heavy focus on leadership. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that one of the things that we also focus on and that we put as a cornerstone and a priority is mental wellness, um, especially with everything that's happening um, today. And uh, we, we were sharp in being able to pivot to online, but the beauty of it is that we also grow food. Uh, the images that you see here represent some of our young people. We've hired over 35 young people in the last 17 months. Um, we, we have grown, that's the food that we grew. Um, so one of the things that we didn't want to do was to just indoctrinate knowledge to our young people, but actually have them experience um, how to build beds, how to understand and respect uh, the soil that we're going to grow in. We've expanded and um, initially the site that we were assigned, which was is located if you're local to St. Petersburg or the Tampa Bay area, we're behind a community center that's um, right, in, right in the heart of what we call, is known as Midtown. And um, this 0.83 acres of land for us to grow food uh, on. 
We are now, we've, we're past the soil remediation phase, we're past the, three, the tree removal phase, and now we're going into full scale, let's start building our soil. We um, just today delivered a small greenhouse uh, to the site, which we'll erect tomorrow as part of a work day and a visioning day. Um, that greenhouse uh, will grow microgreens. Um, we're all, we also were fortunate to win a grant with the Ford Foundation, partnered with um, USF, and we will be growing uh, hydroponically. So this farm location will be a uh, space for education. So there'll be workshops and classes, but the main energy that we want to push from, from our farm site is that it's a community space. So we want young people to come and read and guess what? Right behind you will be beds and beds of um, of greens growing. We've been, uh, I think I saw somebody may have mentioned it, but um, we're, we're funded, our operational dollars come from the Foundation for a Healthy St. Pete. So we've been very fortunate in that way that we've had the luxury of the time to cultivate and develop young people so that when we say we're a youth-led program, um, if you talk to our young people, we had someone on yesterday and they asked the question, well, what's growing hydroponically? And, you know, I was nervous to see if they would be able to respond, but they didn't disappoint. They understood what it is that we're planning to do in the vision. Um, trying to see what else I would like to share with you guys. Initially, when we when this program began, we weren't we would not have been able to sell at the farm location. We would have to grow the food and we could literally sell at the on the parking lot next door at the rec center. And um, some of the policies in our city that is shifting is going to allow us to be able to sell on site at the farm. If you drive by today, you'll see uh, seven consecutive vacant lots and you'll see things starting to take um, shape. But we do a lot of visioning with our young people to say, what do you want it to look like? Um, Part of what we're focused on right now is actually a huge effort and community survey to find out. Yes. So it's a big effort to find out what kind of things um, would the community like to grow, right? What What are you buying? What do you wish that you could afford to buy? Um, the effort with the greenhouse, 30% of all the food we grow in that greenhouse will be donated back to um, community efforts. Um, so. That's a little bit about what we do and definitely the policy that's going to impact us the most initially is not just for us, but is the recent uh, movement on allowing um, residents and community gardens, farm spaces to grow and sell food um, where they grow the food at least 12 occurrences per year. So that's major for us. Um, and that should be going before our city council and shifting soon. We also would love to see in our city, and especially in the urban areas where there's a shortage of fresh, healthy uh, foods, we do have a lot of corner stores. And we do want to see um, incorporated in those corner stores where people already shop um, the ability for them to carry fresh, locally grown uh, fruits and vegetables. So I'll stop there and I'll await um, questions and put us to the question and answer period sooner. Great. Thank you so much, Carla. Uh, again, I'm personally familiar with the program. It's, it's uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. The work that you all are doing is amazing and I look forward to continue to support it. Um, we'll, we will be getting ready to wrap up. Kendra, if you could go ahead and put up uh, the last presentation and we'll uh, get ready and take questions and close out once we complete this. So again, I'd like to thank all my panelists. Uh, just to wrap up as to why this was an important topic for us. As a food policy council and a statewide food policy council, one of our roles is to address gaps in the food system. And one of the gaps that we identified was this. So next slide, please. 
just touching on some of the uh, discussion and some of the, highlight some of the areas that have been mentioned, mostly by Tanika, the dispossession of 98% of black agricultural landowners in America is part of our history of racial injustice that is usually important, but mostly overlooked. So um, overall, farming in the U.S. has been enmeshed with both racism and capitalism in a way that has had a profound impact on who owns, accesses, and benefits from farmland. So due to uh, legal laws and racism, we've lost almost 12 million acres of land. So that's kind of hard to um, regroup and to catch up. So that's put us at a disadvantage and at, and, at, and at a loss. So that's why this was such an important topic. And in the South in particular, we've taken a huge hit, mostly from the 1950s and onward. The Atlantic reports that a million Black families have been ripped from their farms in a war waged by deed of title and propelled by white racism and local white power. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't go through this. Tanika touched on it. She touched on Pickford. And when I met her, she was working with a lot of Black farmers, and they were looking at the legislation around Pickford. And she was very instrumental in making sure that they, um, you know, kept important points in around action and why these points were very important as they negotiated the settlement on behalf of these farmers. And yesterday, as you all know, Senator Cory Booker announced the first of his kind proposal that would institute civil right reforms within the USDA um, that would hopefully provide over 20,000 land grants each year to Black farmers to reverse decades of land law. So that'll be critical in putting Black farmers on an equal playing field, which hopefully eventually will, we will be able to say that all farmers matter. Next slide, please. That's just some research and some websites that you all can look at if you're interested. I'm writing a paper on this, a white paper around Black land loss and um, I'm doing that for my PhD coming up soon. So that's something that I've been studying that I look forward to completing. So here's some links for you all if you're interested in uh, doing some further research as well. Next slide, please. And finally, what can you do locally? You can volunteer your time. You can join groups like the Florida Food Policy Council. You can make your voices heard. You can become a leader in your own community. Learn your local leaders, your property appraisers. Learn your local zoning commissioners. Learn local zoning codes and land laws. Help conduct policy scans and policy assessments of vacant land in your community. And uh, if you're not a member of our council, become a council, uh, become a member. We can help. If we don't have the answers, let's work together to find them. We have an incredible board, which consists of experts on a range of topics throughout the food systems, from our GIS expert to, you know, Rachel Shapiro, who's working on a food hub that I'm sure she has uh, connections and she's worked and navigated through zone zoning in various areas to build a food hub. We have Dell the Chance. So we have experts that are available to provide technical assistance to our members. So utilize and leverage your membership. Uh, that's what we're here for, to provide you guidance and assistance. So if you're not currently a member, think about becoming a member. And remember, become a leader in your community and educate and advocate for yourself and others. So 
Uh, with that, again, thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for attending our forum. We'd like to thank our sponsors for helping us to continue to provide these forums. The Florida Food Policy Council is a nonprofit organization, and all of us here are volunteering our time to better the Florida food system. If you are interested in what we are doing, again, we encourage you to become a member. If you are able to donate or are interested in sponsoring our programs, we would be most appreciative. I would like to give a special shout out to Kendra and Dell. Dell couldn't be here today due to technical difficulties, so I hope I did an admirable job of filling in for him because he's usually the host of these forums. Him and, he and Kendra do an incredible job of hosting these forums for us, and it takes a lot of work, and without them, these forums wouldn't be as successful as they are. As they are. They are very important to the work that we do throughout the state, and uh, on that, again, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank our incredible board for providing a safe space and a place for us to have these sometimes difficult but yet important conversations that need to take place. So with that, I'll leave it to Kendra to tell us a little bit more about our, up our upcoming forum in December. Again, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you again next month. Thank you all. All right, thank you so much, Erica. Thanks to all of our presenters. Um, we are so happy to have you and thank you for staying for questions. Um, I will talk a little bit about our upcoming uh, forum after the questions. Um, for now, we did have a lot of questions come in uh, before the forum, in fact, uh, and I'm seeing a lot of questions in our chat box coming in right now. Um, one of the main questions that we actually had come in was about how to obtain land um, and how to how to access land, especially in suburban areas. So this question is really open to any of our panelists. Um, uh, how would do you have any uh, suggestions? The best way to access um, land and, um, and and get that started. Uh, this is Carla with the St. Pete Youth Farm. From my perspective, one of the best ways to approach it is certainly in your neighborhood where you live, if you have a neighborhood association and you see there's a vacant lot or that lot is currently um, owned by the city, then you can approach the city about your intentions to grow food on the, the, the lot. And I think in many cases, depending on if you get buy-in from the other members in your neighborhood and community, you may be able to get either a um, you know a minimal lease agreement with your city to grow food on that land, um, but they would likely be more uh, apt to to give you a yes if you come as a neighborhood association. Is how I would approach it. They're also. Oh, go ahead, Tanika. Thank you so much. Nika here. So there are a few other options too, depending on what your community looks like. Um, because in sometimes with some federal programs, which also could be interesting. Um, so there, there are pieces of land that are sold to the government, one. Um, but two, there are also other programs with like your ports. So sometimes your ports around you own some of your vacant land pieces. So those could be conversations also with your port authorities and other places. And sometimes they have bonds also attached to those things as well. Uh, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we have a few other questions. Um, Arlie asked, do you have any recommendations on how to shift the policy focus to combat food apartheid and not just focus on access? I might not be the best answer for this. I, I wish I just saw Malik. Hello, Malik is on the list of people who uh, made a comment. Um, but within that construct, I feel like. So within this conversation, right, a black about black farmers, I feel like there's always a conversation that leads to the main focus that we're talking about now. Um, so oftentimes you go 
to have that conversation. It's just you taking that piece of that conversation and adding to it a little more to say, this is, this is our focus. Like we understand this is the entire issue, right? And this is about apartheid. So we need to, it's, I don't feel like I'm giving this question justice, um, but to be able to set aside and just say, just have the same conversation, but focus it a little more. And and to go to who's going to listen. And if you're here in Florida, talk to Erica um, and everyone else here and have conversations and don't be afraid to have those conversations, period. And I'd be remiss, I didn't see another one of my mentors, Malik Yakini from Detroit is on the call. Another person that without him, um he's he's an innovator in this movement so i stand on the shoulders of giants so thank I'm, I'm honored that he's even on this call so if he's still on if any if he had any input on that i would appreciate hearing it no he doesn't <laughs> i have something to say Yes, please go ahead. Please. When it when it comes to the issue of food apartheid, um, that's something that's more of a systematic issue. And for us, we believe that most of the change can happen from the ground up. And that, that comes with increasing the access of food through the food through through presence. So encouraging farmers to supply food to their communities directly. Um, and creating more avenues where food is accessible, like the farmer's market. Um, CSA is an example, but farmer's markets, we believe is an underrated aspect that helps challenge the food apartheid system. Um, it is true that when it comes to access to food, transportation, things like transportation are huge barriers in terms of having access to those grocery stores in the presence of food deserts. That is something that can be addressed one of the ways um, that we're doing it in our community is we communicate with the food co-op in our neighborhood. Now, it's not even in our, in our neighborhood, it's, it's in our city, it's outside of our access point, but we press them about creating transportation for people in the French town area so that they're able to have access to that space via the supply of a, of a, of a food bus. So that's just one of the small examples of how the issue of food apartheid can be addressed. It's a systematic thing. You can press people about providing transportation to um, or having ac transportation access points in your community, but also help fueling it from a grassroots uh, perspective. Thank you so much, um, Kip. That, yeah, um, Kip, that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. We actually had a, a few questions um, for Angelique and Kip. Uh, Anthony asked if you had any um, land use barriers or zoning issues that you faced with setting up the youth farm in Smarter by Nature. Um, would you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, uh, land, land use is a huge thing. It's an issue here in the capital of Florida, Tallahassee. Uh, one of the things is that uh, there's, there's as of now, there isn't land zone for small scale agriculture. And small scale agriculture, even though it's a pivot in terms of changing the issues of the food crisis today, uh, it's something that's not on the radar. It, it's becoming on the radar. So there's efforts that are being made right now. But when we first came in our business, that these zones did not exist. So um, we had to just partner with nonprofits and people that really purchased the land themselves. Uh, and we had to partner with them when we first started in order to get access to land. We encourage anybody to really be in communication with your elders, because right now we don't own the land that we farm right now, but it's an elder in the community. She uh, was with us while we were doing a workshop at FAMU and she offered us the opportunity to be able to cultivate her space. So when it comes to access, uh, that's something that just communicating with people 
is something that could be opened up, partnering with other like-minded individuals in your city and saying who's willing to take up this task. That can be a huge uh, thing, but zoning has been an issue for us. And it's something that in urban areas, it's, it's the, the narrative is starting to change and the, the, the dialogue is being created. Um, well, we had another question from Kitty. Um, so definitely with uh, financials, <laughs> where, uh, so I think this question is um, more for the Healthy St. Pete, uh, for Carla, your projects, and, and for everyone, I think, is where do funds come from? Where do, where do you get funding for your foundations? So, um, so for our, our specific uh, program, uh, we're heavily supported by the city of St. Petersburg. Um, that's why I made the, the mention of it being within the mm -hmm. South St. Pete CRA, the youth that participate live within that geographic area. And so that's where the funding to pay the young people comes from. That's the land belongs to the city. So the land is approving funds and has approved the funds for the soil remediation that was completed, the tree removal that was completed, and over $100,000 to help us with the development of the land into a farm. The funding that pays myself and uh, for programming and all the other ancillary charges, uh, operational charges, comes from a local foundation in St. Petersburg called the Found uh, Foundation for a Healthy St. Pete. And um, so now what we're doing as we're getting closer to seeing the dream realized, we're, we're gonna naturally rely on support from other organizations that might be smaller and community support. So I mentioned that I picked up a greenhouse today that was donated. We picked up a half size basketball court that we're gonna install to use um, as surface space um, for interactions. That was uh, donated. We have a hydroponic system that was just donated to us you know, valued over three thousand plus dollars. So I think once the word gets out uh, more and more, and people start seeing um, that vacant land become something, and especially when you see youth involvement in this day and age, I think um, you know you'll start seeing the the funding take shape. I don't think that this space that we have, I mentioned, this 0.83 acres of land, is enough to grow enough food to multiply and have it be self-sustaining in that way, but we're building entrepreneurs as well. So if you came out tomorrow to volunteer with us, you'll taste fire cider that our youth made. It'll have our branding on it, and we'll start selling those, those types of things that we could sell year round and, um, and see about that sustainability uh, aspect of, um, of the land that we have. But I think with us having that large greenhouse that we will have to grow hydroponically, we will be able to produce food uh, year round and that's partnered with uh, USF. We'll have those students um, there with us. But I think that, um, you know, my belief system is that communities are self-healing and self-sustaining if only, you know, you make aware to the community what's, um, what's needed. Um, but that's where the, the heavy lifting financials uh, came from. Thank you, uh, Carla. We also have another question, which was from Glynis. And I think this is for all the panelists. The question is, do you lobby black politicians and celebrities to take on this issue? It's Carla again. From my perspective, um, we do it all the time. So it's important to me that um, I bring the, we just had a state senator win re-election. Um, this is his third visit to interact on uh, interacting with our youth. Uh, everything from our county commission, our our, um, our mayor, our city council. I constantly invite them so that from an advocacy standpoint, um, we have our youth learning that these are people that um, that affect, that create policies that affect what we do, how we do it, how I talked about the fact that in the beginning, it was, we were perplexed by the fact that a city approved us to grow food, but we couldn't sell food where we grew it. That was strange to us. But again, that advocacy and um, it not being just one person, um, you have to slowly start working each individual um, a politician because they make so many decisions and our young people will say, 
but I'm not interested in politics. And then I have to start the conversation about the broken sidewalk is politics, the stoplight or lack of stoplight or stop sign, or if there isn't one or, you know, funding for schools. And then when you learn that political piece is so it's key, it's critical. Um, so you have to have the conversations when you don't need anything so that when you do, um, people are likely to welcome the, the phone call. And I'll add to that piece too, because you're right, Carla, but it also depends on how people are starting, right? Because some people see this as a massive task. And sometimes it's just letting people that you know, know about what's going on and having that constant conversation and bringing them to the work that you're doing or talking to them about certain plights of certain farmers or your community. Because oftentimes, a lot of people think they have to reach out and know this certain celebrity or know this certain person. And sometimes it's just connecting those that you know, because those that you know, know other people and those people know more people, right? And then they can get the conversation and be also advocates for what you're doing and the needs in your community and the issues around farmers and producers as well. Thank you, Tanika. We have time for one last question. And this is going to be for all of you. And this is a great question here. Um, Christopher Ramirez would like to know, has anyone had success working with religious organizations with land for use for growing food for food pantries, and I, I would assume also for farming. He's seen some studies on underutilized land at churches and other religious institutions. So have you all had any partnerships with any religious institutions for the use of their land? I can start off by answering that question. Um, sure. When we first started, we um, started at a community garden and we had the opportunity to manage a farm that was owned by a church and that really helped us a lot because it was our first year of urban farming and it allowed us to get experience so that opportunity really allowed us to be where we are today and through our like continual journey, like keeping on the same path and sh sharing more and just growing more, the word got out and we were allowed to um, grow from there. Yeah, and we we encourage we encourage that we encourage people to hit up um, institutions to link with institutions um, like churches in your community. Cause in in our in our in our neighborhood, there's a church for uh, every block. So um, that have that have land, like you say. So communicate with them and push the envelope. And a lot of churches pastors come to us before looking for advice on growing with their people. Pastors are starting to push health in the church as well. So we think that it's a great time to um, have that dialogue with churches. All right. Anybody else? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, too, I, I feel like I keep saying bring it back to the smaller level sometimes. But your local church and who you know from that church, because the conversation might not be they might not be willing to grow immediately, but they might be able to host a a, a small farmer's market or some other pastor or even some classes around farming and agriculture, right? So sometimes it's the stepping stones that get you into the bigger platform for growing and, and using their land. So, and then there are also a lot of organizations, um, what is it, the, the, the Black Church um, and Faith and Farm and Ag Project, I forgot the name of that offhand. Um, but just do some research too, because there are a lot of kind of established programs that do those connections and have people linking in, um, and it makes the conversation a little easier as well. All right. Again, I'd like to thank everyone. Kendra, you want to wrap it up? Yes. Um, thank you so much to our amazing panelists today. Thank you, Erica, 
uh, for moderating. I know there was a bit of a, a short um, preparation period this morning. So thank you for doing such a great job. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Our next forum is going to be in December. Uh, normally it's the last Friday of the month, but because of the holidays, it's going to be on December 18th. Our topic is going to be community gardens, what has been done and what's ahead. Our guest speaker will be Kitty Wallace. Um, and she's joining us today. Thanks for being with us today, Kitty. So we look forward to seeing you all next month. The information for the event is already up on Eventbrite. It's up on our website. It's up on our Facebook. And we will also be doing a recording of this webinar to our website and our YouTube channel, all of our channels within the next few days. So please keep your eye on that. Thank you, everyone, and let's all stay connected. We need each other, so let's reach out, everyone. Um, all our information will be posted, so let's stay connected. I appreciate all of you. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carla, Tanika, Angelique, and Kip, and Erica. Have a wonderful weekend. Yes, Carla, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.